Arizona, what a very good comment. You say, I, you, I remind you of the groundhog dancing in its hole. I can only think that you're thinking of the gopher in Caddyshack. Is that correct? Uh, brilliant, brilliant film. And yes, I can imagine exactly why you would have seen my dancing style as similar to that of the gopher in Caddyshack. Before I say something else ridiculous, let's head across to Brent and find out what's happening with those elephants. Well, we've traded the largest land mammal for the tallest. Uh, a little bachelor group of giraffe. Uh, they are not inside Cheetah Plains, however, they are Kruger National Park giraffe. And I can see one, two, three, four giraffe. Unfortunately, they are directly to the east in the very, very bright light. So we'll just have to deal with a silhouetted giraffe. But nice to see a, a sizable group, and it's four together. And we don't often see big groups of giraffe in this part of the world, as uh, we don't have that many acacia trees. Now, to the east of here, in the Kruger on the Basalt Plains, I've seen groups of, from one spot, I've been able to see about 60 giraffe. Enjoying a breakfast of guari. <laughs> so you can see one, two heads in silhouette. And you can see number three off to the right, number four in between, and number five is out at the back. Let's just see, there should be a nice little window coming up. There we go. How's that, Brian? There we go, peering at us. I mean, we can actually hear them chewing from here. Headed giraffe. Oh, no, just one. So you can see all young males. Uh, number five is about to come into shot from the left of the one we're looking at now. We'll wait for him to walk through. Yeah, there's number five. Five boys all together. Michael, who's 18, says, where are all the female giraffes? We've only been seeing bulls recently. Well, Michael, I think with the drought, they've probably moved through to acacia-rich areas on gabbro and basalt soils. And of course, they have to... There's six. Every time I look, another one appears. Six young male giraffe. Brian, you were saying the most you've ever seen in a group here is seven. Yeah, I think seven. Well, we're getting close. Maybe uh, another one is going to pop out to equal. Now, the one nice thing about spending time with little bachelor groups like this is quite often they will play fight. And it's called necking when giraffes swing their necks and hit each other. But these guys look like they're more focused on feeding. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six giraffes, definitely. Come on, Brian, let's find seven and eight, set a new record. Can anyone remember what is the most giraffes we've ever seen on a group, in a group here on Safari Live? Uh, let me know, questions at wildearth.tv uh, or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. What is the most giraffe you've seen in a group here? on Safari Live. I think seven is mine as well. I'm quarantined. Mm. Yes, I do remember that sighting. I'm just going to move forward a little bit. 
Now, Georgie is wondering, at what age do giraffes finish growing, or they, do they continue to grow throughout their life? Um, I think, if I remember correctly, they finish growing at around 15, and they live for, or maybe even a bit younger than that, about 10, between 10 and 15 years old, and they live for about 30 years, so quite long-lived. Looks like we're not going to break our record, Ryan. Only six, but I'm trying to peer through the white light into the distance to see if there's not one or two more. Ah, seven! There's seven. See them through the gap there. So, we go right in the distance, um, so a little bit further to the left, and zoom. A little bit to the left again. And just see the head popping out left. There we go. Number seven in the distance. Now, another young male. Okay, so we've equaled our record. Well, this is definitely the largest bachelor group of giraffe we've seen. Come on, where's number eight? Or do you think that's too wishful, Brian? Mm. Let's move forward a little bit and see if we can spot an egg. But as I said, unfortunately, they are in very harsh light up against the eastern horizon. So let's just say we've had eight or oh, seven. I was being premature there. Silhouetted giraffe. Well, there we go. Seven. We've equaled the most giraffe in a group record for Safari Live. Seven. And I'm hoping for eight. What we might do is because it looks like they might move on to Cheetah Plains a little bit later, is we're going to go check the southern open area and then come back and maybe they'll be out in the open and we can break that record on this sunrise safari. So we're right on the boundary of the Kruger National Park. So Alice is wondering, at what age do female giraffe force the males to leave their... Oh, sorry, the male giraffe force the females to leave their sons? Uh, probably when they're about... Oh, what's that? No, sorry, false alarm. Stick cheetah. Uh, but uh, I'm not actually 100% sure, but I would guess it's probably around sexual maturity. Probably 7 to 10 years old. Uh, maybe even a bit younger. But with giraffe, because they don't live in in set herds and have set territories, it can be very variable that you could find a young male still hanging around with his mom, even while she's starting to mate again with other males. Okay, so we're going to head towards the southern open areas, and uh, fingers crossed that we're going to find a sign, or even better, find Inkanyeni, my favorite female leopard on Safari Live. And while we do that, let's go see how James is doing in the West. Very, very impressive to have found some vanishing giraffe, wouldn't you say, Eggsy? Yeah. We have found some non-vanishing dica, which is quite nice. And they're just very picturesquely sat here amongst the leadwood trees at the very base of the Juma concession. Is that not picturesque, Eggsy? Very. Yes. The sun is warming our faces. The cold front I've predicted is, uh, well, not materialized. And way in the distance, I can hear the call of the southern boo boo. Oh, so nice. Very peaceful Sunday scene. Delicious. Delicious, delicious. Unfortunately, I cannot tell you anything further about big game species, as Brentley o. Smith likes to call them, the hairies and scaries. <laughs> if I ever use that term again, please slap me over the back of the head. Only Brent can get away with that. 
Have you got there? Yeah. Still there, yes. They're not vanishing darker like in Brent's giraffe. Alrighty, let's continue. We've just come now to the point where we're at Twin Dams, basically. It's Twin Dams off to the left-hand side of your screen, which we're not going to show you because it's not looking quite as picturesque. It's still a bit scarred after it was cleaned out for the rain. It will become less so as soon as we get some water on it. And we were just going to come into this area to see if we could see any Kurula tracks heading up or down. Nothing so far, just a few baboon tracks. In fact, that might be quite interesting to show you in the absence of anything else. There we are. Can you see that track over there? Yeah. So if I get out, you're not going to say, I can't see it. Are you sure you can see this track? Yeah. You're very sure? Yeah. Okay, good. Here is a, it's actually not a baboon, I think it's a monkey. Mm. No, it could be a small baboon. Anyway, what you can see here, I'll show you this one first. This is the back foot. There. There's the thumb. And there are the four fingers. So they've got sort of opposable toes, if you know what I mean. And a monkey, we were talking about bipedalism and you know, the, the fact that human beings can stand upright. Monkeys can stand upright, and I've seen them standing upright, but they can't really walk. They can move a little bit like that. They kind of waddle along, and then they inevitably fall over because they can't maintain that. They've got a totally different foot structure, totally different ankle structure, and totally different attachment of the sort of hips to the spine. And that's why they walk with a very flat, um, you know, their ankles are, are set much further up the back of the foot. And they're able to sort of, they're much more flexible than ours are. Ours are pretty un inflexible. Then here, in fact, these are definitely baboons. If you find a monkey with a hand that size, get out of the way. Can you see this one? There's a hand. And you can see the thumb there and the fingers, one of which I've managed to draw over. So about the size of my palm. I suppose that baboon's hand, uh, not a very big one, uh, they normally they can get up to sort of half the size of my hand, their hands, uh, but they're obviously incredibly powerful, much more powerful than we are. This is a perfect spot to stop and have a cup of coffee. A beautiful bird song, sun warming the face, Sunday morning, but we'll continue on and try and find some large animals. What have we going to find, Eggsy? Some? Correct, not hairies and scaries. Good, well done. On we go. I think those monkeys have probably headed towards, or baboons, have headed towards that jackalberry tree. Let's go and look there. The jackalberry tree has been fruiting highly productive for primates of late. into the river, the roaring torrent. You all right there, Eggsy? Good, good. Smell of potato bush, another wonderful smell of this time of year. So nostalgic for me. Takes me back to when I was romancing a girl in the bush once. She's now married to someone else. Oh well. Now, Iggy, there's quite a nice bird there. Oh, don't go away. Can you see it there? It's a spotted thick knee. That's the one. And we don't often see them nicely during the day. They're largely nocturnal. And let's see if we can get another view. There might be a water thick knee. I didn't see it properly. I know there is a couple that lives next to Twin Dams. I think they're also starting to think about having a nest. They're in there. You see them there? I'll just can show you the difference between the two. 
used to be called a dikop, which means thick head. Now they're called thick knees. Don't ask me why. It was indeed a water dikop. There you are. And the difference between that, of course, and the spotted dikop is eggsy. What? These spots. spots. Well done. Good. Yes. Spotted dikop, very spotted. Water dikop, not so much. If you see them just quickly, you can see that line there that is very clear on the water dikop. Marvellous. Very good. On we go. We'll just pop across to this jackalberry tree up here and see if there isn't something there. Mm. Aaron, in New Zealand, you say you're looking forward to the springtime when we'll find a little few more birds, a few more waterfowl, perhaps. Uh, yes, I am too. But of course, we're not going to find more waterfowl if we don't have quite a lot more rain, which I think we should do. But when, those wa when these water holes do fill up, we'll have some lovely birds to look at. There's another diker. There are baboons. Look at them coming out of the tree there. See that? desperately don't want to get caught in the tree with us coming up so close. Isn't that fascinating? They don't feel safe in a tree and it's a common common thought. And a baboon or a monkey, if a human being comes along will go into a tree. They do exactly the opposite. Because they don't know how well we can climb. They don't know that we're incompetent in trees. So they get very nervous and they start peeling out of the trees as soon as we get near. There's another one coming down now. Big baboon coming down out of the tree. There it goes, running across there. Oh, it's very sad that they're so unconfiding. I mean, they will get used to people eventually. Because they're wonderful to look at. And another diker. Well done, Eggsy. That is the 75th diker we've seen today. Now, let's ease our way, I think, up the drainage system here and see if we can't pick up a few more baboons. They're just sitting up in the sun there. I can't see any more in the tree. No. You see them there, eggs? Just tell me when you want me to stop. They're not being particularly brave about seeing us, I must say. You got them there. Yeah, they are. There we go. <laughs> Sat down, like Lord Muck. They are endless entertainment. If you can get them to sit still, they really are fascinating to sit and watch. Mainly because, of course, they look so very human. You see what I mean by the ankle joint there? It's longer than ours and stretches up. And you may have just heard a little bit of groaning and grumbling. It wasn't, in fact, a diker being killed by a leopard. It was Eggsy's stomach. Eggsy, are you hungry? A little bit. Well, we've got quite a long time before breakfast, my friend. You're going to have to hold it together. We might find you some jackalberries to eat. Let's carry on. <laughs> See what else we can find along here. Very, very old buffalo skull here, Eggsy. Do you see that? It is so long dead. It is almost a fossil. Oh! I 
can hear the music again, but that's not why I've stopped. Siberia Zumi, I've just heard a greater blue-eared glossy starling going. We'll go back a bit and see if we can't see it quickly. So, what I think is quite interesting about this buffalo <coughs> skull is that it's disintegrating. You see how the horns are slowly being eaten away. Eventually, all of this calcium will disappear. And if, as I've said to you before, I think there's a, often a misnomer that a fossil is in fact a skeleton that's just been preserved. Um, it isn't. This bone will not last forever. It will, it, you know, under the action of sediment, or sedimentation, it could form a fossil, but it will disappear into the earth and become part of the dust of the earth again, well, within probably a few years, but it won't last for very long. It looks a little bit like it's been placed there as a prop. That <laughs> Eggsy can't hear the music. I'm beginning to think I'm going mad. But every Sunday morning I hear it, so I'm not convinced that I am mad. Let's go back a little bit and just see if we can't find this greater blue-eared glossy starling for Siberia. I don't see them. Hmm? No, my earpiece is in. I got that. I already mentioned that it was Siberia Zumi who was looking for the starlings. Let's just uh, go across to Brent and get an update from him. He has been off the vehicle tracking something, so let's find out what it was. So we found tracks of Inkanyeni, the female leopard I'm looking for. Unfortunately, they head straight south into Mala Mala, where she has been keeping her cubs. But it's always worth stopping and having a look around this large open area. I can't see my mate, uh, Gnormless Gnorman, at the moment, but maybe he's around, resting under a bush somewhere. Now it looks like we're not the only ones checking the open area. There's a vehicle from the south also having a look. Spotted Gnormless yet, Brian? Where is he hiding? And it is beautifully quiet and peaceful up here, or down here in the east. Very, very, very little in the way of mammalian wildlife. <laughs> but we do have some birds. To add to the birding list. Oh, there we go. There's a crowned lapwing. Well, I know we're looking for all the starling species possible, but we can also do, I think we can do a fair shot at lapwings. I think James already had a discussion with a blacksmith lapwing. Now, I wonder if this crowned lapwing is running towards us. Is he running to towards us to tell us there's a cheetah present? Somehow I don't think so. I think. What do you got, Brian? Oh, well done, Birchall Starlings. I think James got those. I think the Mala Mala guys spotted in Ganyeni and the Cubs, possibly all male cheetah. So we're going to be doing the sneaky safari. Let us see where. What on earth is he off roading for? What do you think, Brian? Think cheetah or leopard? Both cheetah and leopard in the same tree. Or possibly lions. Let us stop opposite him. Oh, he's not gone too far or too deep into the bush there. I think it's time to put.
people out in the binoculars. What on earth have you seen, Mr. M Mr. Man? Now this is the area where Inkanyan has been keeping the cubs. Now what we're looking for, and normally I would never say this, but look where the cameras are pointing. <laughs> What I think also might be, he might be just checking the last position. He's heading down a little deeper. Let's do the same. Now, unfortunately, there could be something behind a gory bush that we're not going to be able to see. I just want to check in that tree. No, there's nothing there. Oh, I think he might be fishing, just like we are hoping. But we did get some interesting birds out here on the open area last time I was down here. So, let's see if we can get some more around this little water hole. So far I can only see some ring-necked doves. If we look carefully, often there might be a little wader taking advantage of this little bit of water. Not today. Last time we were here, we had a wood sandpiper, if I remember correctly. Not today, just the dove. Now oh, there's some very noisy lap wings up in the sky. You can hear that constant calling. Uh, I'm also just checking the far end of the open area for those male cheetah. Now when you use binoculars over a big open area like this and you're using them to hopefully spot something, there's a wonderful technical term for it. It's called glassing. I'm busy glassing the open area. Alas. Not much out there. Hi, Michael. Michael's 18. Michael says his favorite bird is the Woodlands Kingfisher. And he'd like to know when are they going to return? Michael. I actually was having a discussion about that with a friend of mine last night. About when will the Woodlands return? Now, normally, it's almost without fail between the 12th and the 15th of September. However, I just want to look at one thing in the tree, far away down there. Nope, I thought I saw a leopard in the marula in the distance, but it's not. Sorry, Michael, distracted there. Uh, so, Michael, uh, I think with the drought, it's going to be a very difficult one to call, and uh, they might arrive a little bit later. It also depends how much rain has been had further north in Africa on their migratory route. But uh, normally you can bet between the 12th and the 15th of September with pretty fair, fair certainty but I'm not sure that with this dry weather, this drought we're having, whether that's going to be the case. So one of that nice little grassland species we get here is the African pipit. Uh, of course, we've only, I've only seen them once. I think Jamie's seen them, and James have seen them all down here on Cheetah Plains. Uh, there's a Temex Corsa. 
the smallest of the coarser species that really love these short, short grasses. Not even gnomeless gnome in the GNU! Oh dear! Should I be worried for my mate? Ah, I think he's fine. Well, while we continue to search for a heartbeat, or mammalian heartbeat here on Cheetah Plains, it sounds like James has found one on Juma. My favorite antelope heartbeat, everybody, the Nyala. <clears throat> There's a fairly substantial herd of them now, walking down towards where the first one was going. A whole lot of cows glistening in the sunshine there. And quite a lot of bird activity suddenly. Chin spot battises. <whistles> Might be able to hear the Apollos going quack, 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 quack. It's an appalling rendition of its call. I might just play it for you. So I don't think your microphone's pointing in the right place. Hello, Peggy. You want to know if Eland are part of the antelope family? They are indeed part of the antelope family. The antelopes are even bigger than a family, if you like. So they're... Uh, designation goes higher than that. They're a tribe, or almost an um, almost an order, but not quite. But yes, absolutely, Elant are quite closely related to Nyala. They are considered by many to be one of the spiral horned antelope. Can you hear the music yet, Eggsy? I can hear something. You can hear something. Well, that's good that you can hear something. It means you're not deaf. That's very important. <laughs> right, here's the Apollos call, everybody. This is the yellow-breasted. Come on. Oh, here we go. Yeah, that's what we're hearing. Just along the drainage line behind us. That's the yellow-breasted Apollos. And then one or two, also, we've got a few um, orange-breasted bushrikes. They've stopped now, but they were going... <laughs> Beautiful morning. It really is a very stunning, relaxed morning. Of course, I, do, I don't know why it feels like the weekend. It feels like Sunday today, and yesterday felt like Saturday, but every single day out here is precisely the same as the next, so... I don't know why it feels like that. I guess it's probably from the fact that we were, you know, we grew up like that. And Charlotte, while we look at these last vestiges of the Tragalafids going off into the bushes there, you say, have we ever seen an Irland or a Roan here? No, Roan, I, as far as I know, Roan has never been seen here. Irland, yes, once or twice, not common, probably once every four or five years or so they'll come through the Sabi sand, maybe one or two lost individuals. But sable, well, once every year or so, a sable bull is seen wandering through here and then it disappears and sometime, I mean this time last year, a sable bull was spotted on the Juma Dam cam walking across the Juma Dam wall. There's that orange bristled bush rock, just listen to that. Very nice, beautiful bird with an orange breast, um, surprisingly. Hmm. Alrighty, let's carry on. We're heading towards Buffelzook Dam to see if uh, we won't be as lucky as we were yesterday when everyone had been through there as we pitched up. Now uh, the lions arrived. There's a little baby Nyala. We'll see if we can't get a decent look at her, or him, or it. Here's his mum, so I think we probably will get a decent view of him. 
Look, look, look at the little thing. It's tiny. Mum stands about three, three and a half feet at the shoulder. So when the little one runs in behind it, just over a foot, you know, just over a foot tall. Look. Isn't that sweet? So they're not particularly seasonal breeders, the Nyalas. They will have a peak in the rainy season, but you can see there. I mean, that thing's no more than a month or two old. <laughs> very, very sweet. <laughs> Julie, you're wondering about colic in animals out here. Um, I think colic is probably a fairly wide-ranging term. I stand a correction here. But colic is probably a fairly wide-ranging term that describes a number of stomach ailments or gas, I think, in the stomach. Now, we know that human beings get what we call colic uh, when we're little, but I think you're probably referring to the colic that the horses get. Now, as far as I remember from my days as a, as a horseman, colic is caused by the fact, uh, well, sort of buildup of gas probably, or poor toxins in the belly. Horses cannot vomit. They can only breathe through their noses, and for some reason that means that they cannot vomit. And so you have to release something from the stomach, and if a horse gets colic, you've got to put a tube down its nose into the stomach, and then kind of drain the stomach. Now, I don't know about the the ruminants I don't think ruminants can get it I think ruminants can get many other different kinds of troubles in their stomachs but their stomach is so totally different from that of a zebra or a horse that I think the similar kind of thing is probably impossible I imagine a zebra can possibly get colic but I also think that colic as with most domestic animals is probably a domestic animal disease caused by strange diet and eating strange things and living in strange conditions so I think it's probably quite unlikely that zebra get colic and you certainly don't see them uh, sort of rolling around writhing in pain very often unless they're being attacked by a lion of course in which case they do ro writhe around. So I'm going to say no, I don't think they do get colic much. I'm sure it does happen every so often. I don't think a ruminant can get colic though. The stomach is totally differently designed from that of a horse or a zebra. I was rather hoping that we might spot that lioness and her three little cubs somewhere around here. The Nkuhuma pride has been found on Bivol's hook, but they can't tell me whether it's four or five lionesses. And I just wonder, given that we saw the lioness with her five cubs going up towards Bivol's hook yesterday, whether our lioness with her three tiny little ones isn't still around here somewhere. She's been fantastic, you know, those little cubs are so fat. I think she's producing a lot of milk and I think the longer she stays away from the pride, actually the better it's going to be. Because those bigger cubs will push her little cubs off her and enjoy her milk as, in the same way that her own cubs are doing. So I personally think that for the benefit of her cubs, she should probably stay away from the pride for a little bit longer. Let's just watch carefully around here. She's spent a long time around here. She's definitely not here right now. Over there, a Nyala in the midst of his dressage dance. That means there's another Nyala bull around here, somewhere, to whom he is displaying with his magnificent mane stretched up. Isn't that great? I think that's really lovely. Look how slowly he's moving. Each foot taking about five seconds to land. I don't know where his competitor is, but probably to the left of him. Now, Nyala, as many of you will know, avoid conflict by doing these outlandishly ridiculous slow dances around each other. 
and I for many years thought, well, they didn't get very violent with each other, but I tell you what, if this dance doesn't, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me again, if this dance doesn't sort the men from the boys, as it were, then they get very physical with each other, and it is a startling and astounding thing to watch to Nyala bulls face off and have a physical fight. Let's move a little bit forward. I think I can see the other one there. I can, but the other one doesn't seem to be vaguely interested in dressage this morning. He's just eating some, uh, eating some acacia bush, I think. See that? He's not paying any attention whatsoever. <coughs> and he's eating some zebra wood. While his mate walks past at... I don't know what you call a speed so ridiculously slow. There's also, I can hear, a woodpecker pecking around here somewhere. See if I can spot him. And even Eggsy, a humble impala. Let's just have a look at our impala there. It's that thing there. There, Eggsy, you see, I'm scratching his on scratching his back leg there. Hello Joey in Australia. A good one from you about black-faced impala. Not to be confused with black impala. And as that one disappears, I'm going to ask Eggsy to see if... Can you see that blue wax spot on the ground there, Eggsy? With the camera or the car in the way? Yes, got him. Oh, there he is. He's sitting very nicely for us. Joey, black-faced impala you won't see here. They only occur in Etosha. They're a particular sort of... I'm not even going to give them the title of subspecies, but they're a particular group of impala that occur only in Etosha, in Namibia. And they're quite rare... And, I mean, they probably could be considered endangered even, but they do not occur here. And they just look exactly like our impalas. I think they're slightly larger, um, but they have a sort of black stripe that goes down the face. And there's no other difference, really. Then you do get black impala, which is a melanistic impala, completely black in colour. And they are kind of a like a rare game breeders thing. You will find them very, 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 very rarely in the wild. But uh, you do get them. Black impala. They're a bizarre thing to see. But a black-faced impala, Joey, only in Namibia in Natasha. That was quite nice. We had some nyala, impala, waxbills, woodpecker pecking away. Hello. Just greeting the one who wasn't having a fight. Now past the one that's looking a bit ashamed that he was having a fight. All righty, we're going to... Ooh, one second. Just before we go across to Brent Leo Smith and find out if he has finally managed to find a Singapore noodle stand. Do you see that very vast bird over there, Eggsy? With your camera there, it's going to look like a wax bill. But uh, with these powerful binoculars, I'll be able to identify it. It is a batelier, Eggsy. A silhouette of a batelier. Looks like a splodge on your screen there, two pixels in height. So let's go across to Brent and find out how his hunt for a Singapore noodle breakfast is going. Well, it's got a bit better. We've found another herd of ellies. 
and a bit more relaxed. Okay. But there's also what excites me the most. There's a massive Eddie bull right here. So I'm going to try get a bit closer to him. Hello, big boy. Look at that. Oh, let me go forward a bit. Lovely set of ivory on him. Very even. Hello, big boy. Yes, it's so strong. Now, Andrew's wondering, is it true that elephants can smell water from up to a mile away? Andrew, I'd say they can probably smell water from a bit further than that. I'm just trying to see if he's in must. He's not. Hello, big boy. Oh, he's massive. Oh, I love it when those bulls walk like that. He's got the water walk for, for trees. He's hungry. Oh my goodness. He's trying to push down a massive saffron. Uh, he's decided it might be a bit strong. And let's see if he uses his height to pick off some of those saffron branches. He's smelling something in the dirt, and as he breathed out, he created his own little dust. Okay, let's see what he's up to. There we go, the reach. He's using his height get to some of those branches that other Ellie's can't get to. Oh, he just can't get a good enough grip to pull it down. <laughs> so he picks a lower branch. Yeah, I'm just going to try edge forward slightly. Oh, it looks like he might move out into the open for us. Beautiful big boy. Now, for those of you taking screenshots, let me just move forward slightly, get that pesky push out of the way, there we go. Now, from a photography point of view, this is an incredibly, and from a cameraman's point of view, a very incredibly difficult shot because of where he's standing in relation to the sun. So if you are going to take any screenshots, which I suggest you do, uh, think about converting them into black and white with that harsh white light behind might turn into be a very interesting picture and remember to share those interesting pictures with us on our Facebook page Safari Live or on Twitter with the hashtag Safari Live. Sam's wondering, are there any problems with the younger elephants with loss of 
family structure. Um, no, not in this area at Roxanne. The family structures are intact. That only really happened quite a few years ago uh, when young elephant bulls were introduced to an area where there were no big dominant bulls and they became a bit naughty. But if you've got big dominant bulls and stuff, those young elephants tend to behave quite well at the prospect of having a sorting out from a big boy like this. Oh, do you hear that, Brian? Is that a squirrel alarm calling? Mm -hmm. Yes. Let's go have a look quickly. We'll come back to the Ellie's if there's nothing there. As you can see, the elephants have blocked the road. So where that squirrel sounded like it was around here, some of these elephants spread out all through. But who knows, maybe we're lucky enough that the cheetah might be on their way back. Let's just switch off and listen. If he's lord, squirrel's gone quiet. Okay. Sounds like some upset lapwings ahead of us. Squirrel, shout again! That squirrel obviously is like, I can see the killer bees. Let's make a joke. Leopard, leopard, leopard! Ha 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 ha. Evil squirrel. Hmm. I'm going to have a quick look down this open area. Maybe we can see what the lapwings are complaining about. So while we have a quick squiz down towards the, or up towards the north, see if we can see anything that the squirrels and lapwings were shouting at. Uh, let's go see how James is doing. I bring you bad tidings everybody, bad tidings indeed. All of the lions are 70 meters in that direction, 70 meters just inside there if you're working in feet that's about 250 feet uh, <laughs> all five lionesses two Birmingham boys and eight cubs sorely tempted to trespass but I'm not going to instead we'll look at that vulture which is very far away sitting in a tree surveying the Sunday scene it is a white backed vulture Not only is it a white back to vulture, it has also got a quite a full crop, which means it has probably been eating that buffalo carcass that the Nkuhuma Pride rejected out of hand the other day, quite interestingly. Possibly died of some kind of disease, and the Nkuhumas may have picked up on that. And I don't think, you know, you won't be able to tell from there, but the, the full crop is basically a swelling on the throat. It is still full of meat, and it's slowly being pushed down into the stomach. It's quite a good way if you're a bird that has to eat quickly and then fly away before you be, before you get mauled by something. It's quite a good idea to be able to store a bit of food on you, so you can fly off and sit in the safety of a tree like that. More of the magpie shrikes calling in the background. 
very exciting that at least we've got some squirrels alarm calling now in uh, cheetah plains maybe Brent will be lucky maybe they're shouting at a slender mongoose however it's equally as possible as a leopard but we'll hold our thumbs together right our next port of call is going to be the Gallagher waterhole and see what's happening there because there ain't nothing happening at Bivelzook Dam. There was a tea party going on at Bivelzook Dam, actually. Some uh, guests from Vuyatel and Gallagher, they had stopped there to have their morning coffee. Didn't offer us any, did they? Eggsy. Eggsy's stomach started groaning again. And yet still, they did not offer us anything. Very rude. Very rude. Tasha Michelle, you say are we not seeing any animals because they've all moved away because of the drought? Uh, no, I, we're not seeing any animals. I think it's quite by chance. You know, we just, the roads don't cover every piece of land. The elephants seem to have moved off again for a little while. That's not unusual. They do. They come and they go in great numbers. Uh, the lions are just across the boundary. So, you know, they could easily be this side, but they're just across the boundary. So we're not seeing them. Um, likewise, I'm not sure where Karulu and the Cubs are, but it won't be far from the southern boundary. So it's very much just a case of chance, you know, Tasha. It's just what happens. We've seen pretty good general game today. We've seen some nice Nyala, some nice Impala. We've seen 75,000 Diker between Eggsy and I during the course of the morning. Other birds have been pretty good. So it's just, it looks quiet because we haven't had any sort of high profile sightings. We've had elephants with Brent twice. And so it actually hasn't been a bad return, but we were hoping, you know, we go out in the mornings and we hope to find the big cats and that sort of thing. Oh, well, and <laughs> as I was saying, we go out hoping to find cats and cubs and that sort of thing. And sometimes it just doesn't happen like that. And Brent has found an elephant. Go and have a look. Well, it's actually the same Ellie's. Uh, when we couldn't find anything from the alarm calls, we decided to head back to that same bull. And I'm hoping it's going to move out in front of us now. He's just got his head behind the bush. Let's try a different spot. Man. And we'll get a nice window. How's that for you, Brian? Eating the roots of a bush willow. You can hear him crunching. Hey, big man. Oh, he's going to look at that one foot. He's turning that whole tree over. Oh, let's get to the roots on the other side. Not done yet. Look at this. Incredible power. There we go. <laughs> 
They are so strong, the big Ellie balls. They're so wonderful spending time with these big Ellie bulls. Incredibly powerful beasts. But at the same time, they do have a gentleness about them. Not if you are a bush willow though. biggest root from that tree and just pulled right out of the ground. I was hoping he was going to walk right up to us when he's finished munching away. There's something I find really special about spending time with elephants. you read their behavior correctly, you're able to spend an incredible amount of time really close to these massive animals and very safely as well. Oops, sorry about that. Well, it sounds like you guys have got some great black and white screenshots uh, when it's always a good little trick from a photography point of view when you're looking straight at the very harsh sunlight even now as the sun gets higher quite often a lot of these photographs are going to work better in black and white especially elephants are one of the more difficult animals to photograph because they're so big and so gray and if you can get back like now we've got really nice light on the one side of him you can see the I'll wait for him to finish pulling that out dust. Looks like the next little tree is in danger. It's a little sickle bush that he's broken the branch off. So we'll keep an eye on that big boy, but we've also got a nice... Oh, it's on the move now. Younger elephant to the right has been...
feeding behind us while we've been watching. Oh, there we go. It looks like it was about to take out that small bush willow. Digging out the roots there. Go. No, deciding it's not worth the effort. And someone else has already pushed that one down. Oh, Brian, the big boy is coming close to us. That he's removing that head leaf litter to try and get. It looks like there's a bit of green grass under there. Oh, big man. Amazing to sit this close to one of the biggest, or well not one of the biggest mammal that lives on land. He probably weighs about 6,000 kilograms and he's about 15 feet from us. I'm guessing probably around 40 years old. Hello, big boy. Wasn't that just too special? I'm going to try to stick with this ball for as long as we can. Oh, look at that quickly. Sorry, Ron, I just noticed it. Oh, stop doing it now. You're standing on the, <laughs> on the, on the tree. The big boy is now stopped on the right, in the right light, on the western side of the road. Hello, big boy. How's that, Brian? No, he's deciding that pulse form isn't exactly what he wants right now. Oh, 
James Richard said you could just listen to the sound of an elephant feeding all day. The pops, cracks, rumbles. Uh, well, me too, James. It is one of my favorite sounds in the bush. But Lucy saying you can just hear how dry it is with the way that all the branches break under the pressure from elephants. Let's see, where is he going? He's moving off. I think we're going to do the same. We're going to let him enjoy the rest of his breakfast. And uh, I've got one last lead that I'm going to follow up on Cheetah Plains. Let's see if we have any luck. I'm not going to jinx it by telling everyone what it is. Oh, he's going to go past our that little Ellie, still feeding on the same bush. But the rest of the elephants have moved off. Oh, there we go, it's doing the stand on again. <laughs> Not quite as strong as a big one, so it doesn't just rip it out, utilizing its body weight. Okay, little one, let's leave you be. Just keep going. See what else is out and about on the plains of the cheetah. Who knows, maybe there's a cat surprise, I'm hoping. Now it's got to go around the elephant, elephant roadblock push that little tree across the road. Now, Matthew in Michigan would like to know how strong an elephant's tooth is. I presume you're asking about their tusks, Matthew. And they are incredibly strong. They do break, however, when they're fighting or sometimes when they're trying to upheave a tree that might be quite large. Oh, there's another younger bull. Oh, well, sorry, Matthew. Matthew said no, the elephant's actual eating teeth. Right. Matthew, we've got a lovely young elephant bull here. He's got a nice set of ivory for a young boy. Hello, little man. You've got very big teeth for a young boy. Now, Matthew, the actual teeth inside their mouth is a single tooth and they get a few sets through their through their life and they're incredibly strong uh, but what happens is they actually ground it down till there's almost nothing left let's just try and maneuver with this young boy he's probably around 30 oh, sorry mister he decided to change direction. And he looks to be the last of the elephant herd. And there he goes. Heading off to the west. We're going to have one last dalliance in the south. And hopefully it's a fruitful one. But, oh, these eddies are making our life quite interesting with all their road rearrangements. Avoid the big hole there. Okay, so while we head off to the south, uh, let's go back to James and see how he's doing. 
I have adopted a different strategy now. We've adopted the strategy of now cover as much ground as possible. I've s searched very gently and genteelly into every single bush that I've been past today and so far failed to find anything in the way of a cat or anything like that. And so now I'm driving much more quickly, as you can see. Eggsy is looking a bit more terrified on the back of the vehicle. His air beard is blowing gently in the wind. Yes, it's exactly what Eggsy just said. Ex Ranger, you say, if we can't find some hairy and scary, why don't we go and see if we can't find that party in Dixie Village? Sounds like they're having a blast. I agree. I just suspect that by now there'll be a few stragglers there looking a bit bleary eyed after a fairly heavy night of Dixie drinking. I'll see if you... Eggsy still hasn't heard the music yet, so I'm going to stop here next to Sydney's dam and we'll see if we can't hear it for you. <laughs> oh, Eggsy, there is the beastly thing itself. Can you see it there? Look, foul bird, harbinger of doom. The pied crow, everybody. Not usual in this area. If you keep a bird list... He's probably one of the foul birds not on it. And of course, there's the call. <coughs> Horrid call. I think ever since I was forced to read Thomas Hardy as a child, um, I've d disliked crows. They've always made me think of dull, dreary English weather and tragedy. It's not the crow's fault, of course, everybody. The crow just happens to have a bad voice. But it really does have a horrible bad voice. Anyway, let's see, we're just near Sydney's Dam now. See if we can't get a little bit closer to it and see if we can hear the party in Dixie. It sounds to me like it's come to an end though. I can smell some water buck around. Obviously I can't see any. Oh, there, no, same starlings we've already seen. Sorry about that. So Siberia, sorry about that. Hello, Sarah in Cape Town. You're a new viewer, relatively new viewer, and you want to know if there's going to be a fireside chat tonight, and you've never been to one before. Sarah, there is going to be a fireside chat this evening. Uh, the theme will be the Olympics. That's what our theme will be. There's a virtual starling Siberia. I'm afraid I've failed to find you a greater blue eared or a Cape Glossy today. Eggs, he's had enough of those. Um, <laughs> Hello, the Milk Guard. Another wonderful Twitter handle. You say, with us doing the Bush Olympics, how do we stay fit and healthy out here? Oh, well, the answer is that some people don't. Uh, some people stay inevitably unhealthy and unfit. Um, <laughs> some of us run, and we also have a, a little bush gym that we go to, which is, um, well, it's a couple of sticks tied to some trees where we do some pull-ups and push-ups and that sort of thing. Yeah, every day uh, so a few of us try and do something. But it's not very hard if you, you know, if you, if you want to make the effort, it's really not that hard to do a bit of exercise. Some of the ladies do yoga and Pilates. I don't really understand either of them, but that's what they do to stay fit. We have a rowing machine if you want to do, use that. Unfortunately, it's in a rat-infested storeroom, so it's, you've got to kind of deal with the stench of ammonia in your nostrils while you do it. This is Sydney's Dam, and there are some impala there. There's the crow flying overhead. There it goes, Eggsy. Harbinger of doom flying over us, harbinging away. 
and it would seem that the party in Dixie Village has quieted. The last stragglers have made their weary way home or passed out where they stood. So Sarah, yes, a fireside chat today based on the Olympic theme. Two gold medals for South Africa this time round, I think. Two or three? No, just two. Both in on the track. 400 and 800 meters. Very peaceful. Right. Impala are moving off. We shall do the same. Let's head down Sandy Patch Road. It's the only road we haven't driven today. Not so eggsy. Let's probably do it quite quickly, hey? Simply because we need to cover more ground, see if we can find something in the way of a high-profile game species. Hello, Kimberly. You say, how do I keep my energy up all day? I don't. All day, Kimberly, I'll probably have a small collapse after we go off air, and then I'll pick it up again for when we go on air. Uh, Kimberly, I, I don't know. I, it just, uh, when the camera lens turns towards me, I don't find it very difficult to pick my energy up. Now, this is probably because I have a very large ego, I suspect, uh, which is a distressing confession to have to make, um, but one must be honest. I suppose. It's also the joy of performing, Kimberly. For me, I, if somebody says that they've had a laugh at something I've said, well, then I just think it's the greatest compliment in the world. So I guess that's, that's what drives the, <laughs> the energy while we're on, on game. So there's quite a lot of downtime between then and, you know, between drives when we can do various bits and pieces and recharge ourselves. Our male leopard came wandering down here yesterday. But I think he went off towards Simbambili, probably in Vula. His uh, coupling, if you like, with Shiluva complete. Hmm. Anyway, and I've heard nothing on the radio today about Shadow and Tingana. I don't think they've been found again. Hello, Nemo. Well, I, I, you want to know about false estrus and whether leopards can do false estrus in the same way that lions can. Nemo, I think you'll find that they probably do it for slightly different reasons. Just looking at some alarm calling birds here. Nemo, lions come into false estrus to make sure that the males that they're going to mate with are A, going to hang around, and B, so that they can solidify bonds with them. But leopards don't really have that same kind of issue. You know, they don't live in it. Well, I suppose to a certain extent they do. Yeah, you know, if a new male came into an area, they may come into a, a false estrus. And for those of you who don't know, false estrus is when the female will come into a sort of estrus, but she won't actually ovulate. So she'll mate, but she won't ovulate. And that does solidify bonds with a strange new male who has come into an area and dominating it. So, yes, I would say leopards can. But uh, why I was kind of a little doubtful about it, or what I'm thinking about, is the fact that Karula mated six times with Tingana before she produced this latest off, uh, crop of offspring, Shongila and Hosanna. And I wonder if some of that wasn't a false estrus of some sort. I don't think she's had cubs with him before. I think it's always, well, I mean, I think there have probably been various over the years, but Mvula was the last one that she had cubs with. And, yeah, so I don't know, maybe the fact that she, uh, was, these were her first lot with Tingana made her come into some sort of false estrus. I don't know. Very interesting question. Good one. Thank you. But I think it's well possible. Now we have some more starlings. Siberia, we'll try and get you at least two of the five before we shut down. I think they're Birchalls again, I'm afraid. 
I can't believe this. They're not. Right. See the bird? I don't know if you... Can you get the camera up there? It's a Cape Glossy or a Greater Blue Eared Glossy Starling and the only way we're going to know... Can you get it up there? The only way we're going to know is if it calls. Sorry, this light is in the way. Let me go back, show forward back, sideways. Siberia, Eggsy is doing his best for you. Let me play the call. I'm going to play the call of the greater blue-eared glossy starling. Let's see if that's what this is. Because he'll probably respond. Lots of midday bird song now. You got in there. Eggsy is just uh, changing the camera up a little bit in order to get the angle. I could just move the car, Eggsy. It will help. Do you want to go forward or back? Forward. forward. There we go. Yes? Mm, yeah. Oh, well done. Now, <laughs> let me play the call of the great blue-eared glossy starling. Here it is. That one is not reacting. Therefore, let us play the call of the Cape Glossy Starling. This one stubbornly, stubbornly refusing to say anything at all. This is very irritating, Siberia. I cannot tell at this angle whether that's greater blue-eared or Cape Glossy, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. <laughs> and it's just a big black blob. Hooray! Brent Leo Smith has found something that we haven't seen today. It's hairy, but it ain't scary. And I'm as chuffed as cheese to let you know that Gnormus Gnormen, uh, the Gnu, the dominant male of the southern plains of Cheetah Plains, is alive and well and still without girlfriends. Don't worry, Gnormus, summer's coming, your lush green grass will grow and all the ladies will come to you. Oh, Gnormus is staring in the direction where we can hear some elephants. And he's on his way into normal Norman's territory for a furry or a drink at the Cheetah Plains Pan, is my guess. Be careful, Gnormless. I didn't see normal. And there could be. Or well, the arch rivalry continues. But from uh, the killer bees, uh, hopefully we're going to be able to find a bit more on the sunset safari. But it has been fantastic uh, and beautiful. And we did see a record equaling number of giraffe in one group today, seven. So we know eight is the number to do, and there's the thumb to say toodaloo. And of course, there's the ranger race. And well, we have to discuss it. Brian and I have been discussing since we are the killer bees, and since we are on Rusty, we might have to give James plus five uh, heartbeats to start. That's how confident the killer bees are. Anyway, from uh, the Killer Bees, it's been wonderful having you, and uh, we will see you in a few short hours for the Sunset Safari and the exciting Ranger Race, and of course, Fireside Chat. Toodles! That's very kind of uh, Brent to give me a plus five head start. I'll take it. Thank you very much. He'll now not be able to take that back. And when he loses, he'll say, Oh, but I gave you a five uh, head start. So yes, but you said you wanted to give me a five plus five head start. So I'll take it. Thank you very much. I have already five. I'm not sure what I've got five of. Rebecca, what have I got five of?
five points of what, Rebecca? Mammals, birds, amphibians, arachnids. Oh gosh. Not even Rebecca knows what's going on. We'll have to find out from somebody with a brain sometime after breakfast. But there will be a ranger race during the, sort of in lieu of the Olympics today. It will not be a physical race. We've had that and then you will see how that turned out. And you will see Brent and I uh, in some sort of, well, I'm not going, I'm going to save it for you. It was very well filmed by Eggsy. Ah, for every heartbeat we get a point. Okay, excellent. So it can be birds, reptiles. Uh, what happens if it's an insect? An insect doesn't really have a heart, strictly speaking. We'll approve it. So anything, basically, any form of animal life, not a flower. I wonder if we find a sea sponge, if that will count. Good, well I've got five already, that's excellent. That's very kind of Brent to give me those. I'll take them. <laughs> so that is going to happen during this afternoon's sunset safari. And then we will have a surprise visit at the fireside chat from the great Olympic champion himself. The Bush Olympic champion um, I'm not sure if anyone's told you who the Bush Olympic champion is, but I can tell you that it is not me and it is not Brent. It is someone else in the camp who has managed to achieve greatness in athletic and, well, even film prowess during the course of the last little while. We are going to stop here at the entrance to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where it is that we all live. And we shall bid you a fond farewell on the back end of some blue wax bills over there. Those blue birds there. Exe, that's it. Well done. You moved with Capetonian smoothness there. It's the only advantage to a Capetonian. There we are. Look how pretty their colours are shining in the sun. Isn't that lovely? I think that's really pretty. Keep on them. Don't go anywhere from them, Exe. We ain't going to find anything else in 60 seconds. Hmm? There's a whole bunch of them. Good grief. Our cup runneth over. In the background, Siberia, you might be able to hear the greater blue-eared glossy starling going. <coughs> okay, everybody, that's going to be it from us today. Well, not for the day, just for the morning. Thank you, Eggsy, for your efforts. A big thank you to Brent and Brian on the other vehicle. And, of course, to Rebecca in the final control, being ably assisted by Louise Pavid. Mostly to all of you for consistently keeping things going during a quiet drive. We will see you this afternoon at 3 o'clock. Until then, stay safe and happy. Bye-bye. <laughs>